Hey, Shannon, I love it when somebody proves me right. <laughs> I think we all do. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I might love it a little bit more, but maybe not. Maybe not. And and the guest that we have today, Bailey uh, Barnard, I, I, I'm trying to make sure I say this right, uh, has a moment in the interview where he, where he proves me right and about something that I just spent a lot of money on, which is makes me feel even better. So I, 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 I love this interview, if only for that. So the, no, I'll, I'll just good. say that. Well, yeah, yeah well, I think, you, and you made a good point as we were talking uh, with Bailey kind of after the interview uh, that we just went through is about having guests on that add value to our listeners. And I really think this one uh, has that uh, aspect of it, especially with, as it re revolves around storytelling and getting your story out there, finding your story and ways to get it out and, and ways to maximize uh you know, your voice and I'm looking forward to uh, having everybody hear it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I don't have anything more to add. I mean, he proves oh. me right. How could I, I, like, I, I I'm not going to mess with this. So winner, winner. There, there you go. go. Well, he is Shannon Jean. I'm Dave Hamilton. We are small business Inc. and this is small business show episode 322. One of the things that we talk about on the small business show is this, uh, what, what I like to think of as an opportunity as, as business owners to create our own story, you know, kind of mold this powerful narrative around whether it's your business, your brand, your products, and even yourself. It can be one of the most rewarding and powerful aspects of being a small business owner. And it's fun. Because you get yeah, to tell your own story. You get why to wouldn't you do why wouldn't story. you do it, right? Yeah. 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 I think it's awesome. But you know, there's a lot to it and it can be. And what if you're not sure how to get started creating a narrative around the story? Uh, or you have a good story, but you don't quite know how to get it out there. So I'm I'm real excited. Joining us today is uh Bailey Bernard. Founder and Creative Director of Media Stone Creative. Uh, MSC is a, it's a storytelling content creative agency that helps create and promote stories that can make your business stand out. Bailey, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, this is good. It's one of my favorite topics, uh, you know, and, and you can, uh, we, we, we talk about all the time. Why is it, uh, why is storytelling so important for businesses? Yeah, I mean, it's that's how what a business is. I mean, if you, if you don't have a story, then you don't have a business. You don't have a product. I mean, you know, if you look like at infomercials that. or, I mean, really any company, and this is something we really, we really try to hit home in MediaStone is that every business has a story. Every person has a story. Every product has a story. It's not just like, hey, I created something because I wanted to make money. You know, at the end of the day, people create things and they go into business for themselves because they're passionate about something, because they see some uh, some shortcoming in the market or they see an opportunity and they see a way to help people with an innovative product or a service. And, and, and that right there, what I just went through, that is a story. And I think so many business owners don't realize that what they have is a story, what their business is a story. They're not, you know, you're not just selling products, you're selling the reason behind it, the, the, the craftspeople who came up with the idea or the service and who work with you on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I, I think story is fundamental to any business, no matter what you're selling. Yeah, I, I definitely agree wholeheartedly. It, and it, is it, has it gotten more important to kind of build the story around your business uh, uh, as we move kind of into more and more digital and everything else? Is it is it more important now or is it, or is it always been this way? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the obvious answer is yes, of course, it's much more important now, all these different channels and all that. But I really, yeah. I think the st story has always been crucial to business. I mean, you know, back in the 1950s or even before that, like if you wanted to sell a product, you had to explain to consumers why they needed this product, why it was going to enhance their lives or make their lives easier or better. Or if you're, you know, running a service or something, it's, you always had to be able to articulate what it is you're offering and why the people you're offering it to need it. And so that right. is a story that is old as time, you know, from, from the earliest, earliest trading, you know, hecklers in a marketplace that of, you know, thousands of years ago. But of, of course now, it's, you know, you could say it's more important. I would just say there's more access to it. 
um, from a consumer sp- perspective. Um, there are so many more channels available, yeah. so many more different ways to digest content. It, it, it's not just TV advertising anymore, which, right. you know, fr- frankly, right. I, I've, I've never liked, like I'm, I, I always thought to myself, it's like, well, I see something on a billboard or like, you know, a TV commercial or, you know, back in the day, the Budweiser frogs, like why do three chirping frogs make me want to awesome. want to, yeah, right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's an iconic commercial and you rem- remember what it is, but I, I was yeah. always, I never liked advertising. I, I, I kind of came up um, in my career on the editorial side. Um, and, you know, even before that, I'm, I'm a creative writer and stuff like that. We can get into that. But I, I've never really felt that I was duped by advertising, if you will, that that someone can use, you know, marketing research or, or a, you know, a, a funny jingle or something like that. And I would hear that or see that and be like, oh, I want to buy that product. What is so funny now, someone who's never thought that I was susceptible to advertising, I find so many things that I like from Instagram and Facebook now. Like I, I, I have a, you know a pair of shoes and these these pants that I wear all the time. I love. I saw them on face or on Instagram ad, and I'm like, oh, those work, are cool, huh? and I click on it. And it's it's I, I don't know if if maybe I'm just getting older and and you know paying more attention to those things, but if I see something I like or see something with, with a story behind it. And I, you know, those are the channels, you know, mostly on my phone that I, that I access the world at large through the internet. I I find myself much more susceptible to, to digital advertising than I ever was before. Well, I think digital advertising gives us a better opportunity to tell a story in the way that that particular audience to whom we're telling it, wants to hear it right it's not yeah. just well we're all stuck on tv so yeah. that's where we're going to get our story whether it's that's more where, relevant yeah well whether that's where you or i would want to learn about a story right we, we probably don't but on instagram where you're sort of just scrolling and and everything is an interruption in that ads aren't really an interruption especially if they're well targeted you know, you're more receptive to, to hearing a story or experiencing a story there. And I think I think that that part of it is important. I think it, it makes a big difference. And that's why we all you're, you're not alone, Bailey. Like I buy <laughs> stuff that I see on Instagram too. it. And and it's those are some of the best things because they resonate. And then you and then you buy them. And of course, you want to support this idea that you're smart and you bought stuff that's that's smart and so you tell other people and on onward it goes mm-hmm. yeah and what you know it's so funny with instagram and like the, there's so much bad press that targeting gets and privacy and everyone collecting our data and yes there is a, a, a big breach of privacy going on you know i, I that's not I, without, everyone without gives warrant cons- yes. yeah every, everyone gives consent to it whether you know that you want to use the internet you want to use google you want to use facebook you want to use instagram tell you you are you are offering in, in exchange for their free service you are giving them your information i don't mind it i i understand what the concern is for it but what uh, what we as consumer do benefit out, out of it is that facebook and google they have a very good idea of who we are what we like and the types of products and services that are going to resonate with us. Um, and I think that stuff is always improving. Um, you know, there's one thing that's, I don't know how much you guys get into this, but it's the, the technology side of advertising is it's always changing for sure. But especially now the thing, the things called cookies, which you got, you guys sure. may be familiar with, probably some of your readers are basically any website that you go to now, a little thing will pop up that says, Hey, we're collecting information. Click accept. If you want this thing to go out, it, it get out of the way. So you can continue to site. everybody just clicks on that because they don't think twice about it. That is changing. A- Apple is changing the way that they're approaching some of that. And, and Google recently announced that they're changing their approach to yeah. cookies. So I'm curious to see how that is going to change. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's there's benefits in there and there's shortcomings and drawbacks to that type of hyper, hyper target of advertising. It, it's, it's, it's funny, well, the, you know, you, you issue, go on Amazon. Go ahead, the issue go ahead. with that is not so much, you know, you visit my website, right? You visit MacObserver.com. You give us the right to, to, collect data about you and use that data that in and of itself is okay. Mm -hmm. It's when you get, you know, like the Facebook pixel that lives not just on Facebook, but on literally, you know, almost literally every website. And now without you really knowing Facebook is collecting this data of you traveling around the web. It's not just them collecting the data of you on Facebook. It's, right. it's you know, this whole profile. Mm-hmm. And that is what Apple's technology already, even before, you know, the, the next release of iOS, that started with Safari back in the fall. They are stopping that. Like, that does not exist anymore. They, right. you know, the way those cookies work, they don't let you. And I think that's the, 
to me, that's a good place to draw that line. Like you gave this website permission to track you, but you didn't give another website permission to track you here, there, and everywhere to quote. Right, right. right. And and that's, you know, one of Facebook's, uh, you know, biggest issues right now, but they do, they are a mass, massive, massive advertising, advertising entity. And, you know, say what, say what you about the product or the business, they make a ton of money because absolutely everybody now relies on, on Facebook for reaching their consumer base. Yeah. 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 So, so let's talk, we're talking about platforms and I Mm -hmm. want to stick with this topic for a minute. So as a business owner and I'm trying to get out there, okay, I want to get my story out and everything. There's so many places that I'm supposed to be. You know, I got, I'm going to be on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, uh, Snapchat, this, that, and the other. It, what kind of, I mean, how do you manage that, uh, the expectation when you're working with a client, um, you know, where to focus their energy and, and their budget uh, to have the biggest impact? What, what kinds of things um, play a role in those decisions? Yeah, I mean, th- that's such a great question. And unfortunately, the answer really is everything. I mean, there's no... There's no one-stop shop for for reaching consumers anymore, and I think you know that's that's the nature of the beast that we live in right now. But I think what's interesting is that with you know the magic of editing, we we do a lot of video-based storytelling, but we you know we also do a lot of writing, web design, and stuff like that. What is great about all these different channels is that you don't have to do a full-scale production. Okay, here's the thing we're producing that's going on Instagram, and then we'll schedule another shoot and we'll do something. And that, that one's going to be just for TikTok. And then we'll do this other thing. We'll make it go on Facebook and YouTube and our website and add to our newsletters and all this different stuff. What, what I, I think we do really well, and I don't think a lot of agencies are great at this, is, is starting your content with a core thing that you're going to base it around. We, we, we like to do branded documentaries, we call them. I mean, it's really gives business owners and and craftspeople and and you know people offering our service an opportunity to tell their story we we pair that with compelling visuals very much like a documentary format um but you're doing it you know optimally for a phone um but what's great about that is that you can you take that production going into the production you know you got to check all these boxes you got to get TikTok you got to get Instagram Snapchat mm. if that's a place where where the clients are YouTube if, and all these different applications for it but it's also not just okay let's tell your one core brand story let, let's do that boom here's your here's your one video and let's splice and dice that four or five different ways put it on the different channels and we're done while you're shooting we 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 offer what I call a content suite um, where we're not just producing one core asset and then we'll cut that a few different ways for the different channels. There you go. Have a nice day. We pride ourselves in, in giving clients a ton of different assets. So we will take photos. We will do a bunch of shortcuts for in Instagram stories and uh, uh, for TikTok and for Snapchat. And at the end of the day, it, it's my ideal client. When I go in them, we'd say, let's start with a core brand documentary, but then let's have a whole stratosphere of content around it to tell, tell the minutia of the stories about this product or that product. Product or or that new model line or this craftsperson all that and so when we go in over over the course of a weekend or if it's a week long shoot we can capture all of that stuff as long as we anticipate in advance knowing here are all the assets we're going to create then let's back into that during production and while we're there in that few day shooting because that's that's where the where the biggest cost is getting cameras out and getting all you know sure. organizing you know, a whole group of people there but if you can do all of those things and 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 gather all of those assets in a single shoot you are being very very efficient um, and so where where I would encourage business owners, while you do have to be on all these channels um, or it's best practices to be on all these channels, be as efficient as you can so that when you're creating content, don't just create one piece of content that's going to be on the homepage of your website and then run the same thing on the different channels. When you create that one main thing, get as many different pieces of assets as, as you can out of it. Um, so and, that and needs to be a part of your plan, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, from the, from the beginning. Plan, really. Right, right. Uh, mm-hmm. Figure that out. That, that, makes a lot of, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so... Let, let's take a step back here, and and uh, I want to learn about your story. How did you get into this? Uh, which I, and I do like this phrase that's from your website: this multimedia storytelling business. Uh, as you as you talk about it online, how, how did that, how did that start? Yeah, well, so I've I've always fancied myself kind of a storyteller. So I actually I've I've long been a, a creative writer. I went to the University of Iowa, um, you know, very prestigious writing program there, and I went there because I wanted to study writing. I've always had a passion for that, for telling stories, both nonfiction and I love I love to make up stories, um, short stories, and, and novel form. Um, and, and so that's that's the core of who I am. I, I love telling stories. I think that's the the most empathetic way to connect with other people that if you describe who you are, if you tell a story of somebody else, 
people can relate to that and doing that just in the very simplest, simplest form through language, through words on paper. When I was at Iowa, I got into um, a, a student run on campus creative magazine called content magazine. I won their fiction contest. I went on to sell some ads for them and also soon became their editor in chief because I was writing a bunch of stories. And then that kind of got my start in the, in the magazine business from there. Um, you know, I graduated and got a, a low level job at Rob Report magazine, um, which oh, okay. is luxury lifestyle been around since the seventies and they're based in LA. LA. They're based in Malibu at the time. I was also looking at maybe a job at um, an internship at the Boston Herald. And it was a very easy decision to work for a luxury lifestyle magazine uh, in Malibu or to go to freezing cold Boston and uh, write obituaries and fact check for a living. Um, so so I, I got into Rob Report, got into the media business that way. Um, you know, great brand. It was a, you know, kind of a family, family run company. Bill Curtis um, of Kurt Co. was running it at the time. Um, and it was kind of a great place to come up. And I, I sort of found myself in the right place at the right time. I started in August of 2007, fairly low on the totem pole. Um, but, you know, shortly after I started, the economy, you know, had, totally took yeah. a huge dump and everything right. changed. And simultaneous to that, print was going through this whole thing with the iPad coming out and everything going digital and print going out of style. Um, and so I was able to, you know, not just by being younger, but by by being versatile enough and, and able to kind of jump into new roles as things developed and, and figure things out, wear, wear several different hats there. So while I started as an assistant editor, you know, doing fact checking and writing some low level stories um, as the company thinned out, um, you know, a lot of high profile editors got let go and I was able to fill in a bunch of those roles. And pretty soon I found myself, up, you know, the, you know, contributing significantly, if not being the staff editor for or aviation, um, uh, boating, uh, technology. I did a lot with automotive, did a lot with spirits and dining and travel. It, it was a really fun magazine to work for because it covers all these different verticals. And so through that, I'm, you know, I got to do some amazing travels and we can talk about some of that, that luxury stuff. It's a whole different world. Um, but then, right. through, you know, th kind of at the same time, Facebook was coming into major prominence um, as, as a tool for businesses. Instagram came on the scene in 2012. And so I, I was able to kind of pick up the torch where we weren't really doing anything with social media and start, uh, you know, kind of take over those platforms. And before long, I became editor of the website. Um, after a few years of doing that, we had gotten some investment growth. Um, we were then acquired by, uh, Rob Report was then acquired by Penske Media, which owns Variety and now Rolling Stone, kind of the big, mm. biggest publisher on the West Coast. Um, they they bought Rob Report and we got some fun resources. They, they you know, we were able to bit, get a suite of, of, of um, uh, photography and, and video equipment. And me and, and a buddy, kind of a, you know, he was our, our photo research at the time, had got done a little bit of film, uh, had a little bit of film background. I didn't really have any, but we found ourselves with cameras and access to some of the world's highest end brands. And oh. so we just started filming. We figured out how to use these cameras, you know, a couple of little handheld DSLRs and just got out in the field and started creating video for Rob Report in a major way where we hadn't really had the resources to do that in the right way. And then, I, you know, so it's I, through that, I was with Rob Report for, for about 10 years. Through that, I, I got to really uh, uh, hone my writing and editorial and journalistic skills doing that. Got a very good understanding of the digital media landscape, um, especially for social media. And then, you know, running the website and having a keen understanding of, of how, how that, the, the advertising and marketing side of that worked in addition to the content production side um, and getting, you know, getting into Google Analytics and all that detailed stuff. And then sure. again, right place, right time and good position could launch Rob Report Studio um, when we got the, the influx of investment from Metsky Media and was filming all this stuff and, and found that I, I love doing it. I mean, while I'm still a writer and a storyteller at heart, I, I think video is such an awesome medium for telling these stories because it, it gives you kind of the best of all. You get the compelling visuals and the artistic, you know, photographic eye to compose a shot. Um, you, you, um, you know, get to pair in kind of the story writing, especially when you're doing a documentary format, you script these organic narratives that people say together, you pair them with cool visuals. You get some great stock music in there. I've even worked with, I've got a great buddy who's a classical composer and writes some amazing scores for some of the pieces we've done. And you put that all together and you, you have this like film, like even yeah, on a cool. short yeah. form, like a two to five minute thing, you can tell the story of a brand in this very film like format that is just interesting and engaging. And, and especially now the way people are, are, you know, digest content when you're just scrolling past stuff, if you see a few words on your screen, you might stop to read it. But if you see a compelling visual, hear a cool soundtrack and someone passionately talking about their story, that's going to stop you in your tracks. And so you, you are, 
Our listeners have got to be laughing. I just, I spent an episode, I think two episodes ago, but it might've been last week talking about how we're hiring somebody internally to do exactly this routinely for our podcasts. Huh. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah. You're, you're, like, you're justifying this expense I just made, which is. Oh, excellent. so you just so made the expense. You. I was, I was going to use the opportunity to pitch media. Yeah. Stone creative in case you weren't already sold on the business. Yeah. We do yeah. all, so, all of those services. It's all good. Yeah. And, yeah. and this stuff is, I mean, and I, I get it working with like high end luxury brands and products and, and lifestyle type things. Mm -hmm. Can those, uh, or maybe not the same, but similar tactics, you know, can small businesses do this same kind of thing without a huge outflow of capital, but have some kind of impact, uh, you know, similar to get their story out there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, one one thing that high-end brand, brands have, it, you know, is, is obviously a budget to, to hire, you know, big, big LA studios and have dozens of people on set to get this really masterfully created video and all that. I, I think the industry in general is shifting away from that. I, I because I was at Rappaport and lived in LA for so long, I, I kind of had a peripheral view of sort of the industry. Um, and I always, I always thought productions were so overblown that you, you'd go film a car commercial or, you know, have something on set, and there's like, you know, you got dozens of different people and and assistants and assistants to assistants, and you know, a cinematographer and a director of photography, right, and a director right. and a second director, and it's like give me a break. Like, yeah, the, the footage is beautiful and the results you get are, are very, very clean, but with, you know, DSLR cameras and, you know, freaking iPhone and Samsung yeah. phone cameras, Google Play cameras, they're awesome. And with a little bit of, of, of training or tutorial, I mean, a lot of what I learned was online. There's so many great videos on YouTube or, or other channels to figure out how to use some of this equipment, how to do it. You can do a fairly high level of production for yeah, much, great. much cheaper than a Hollywood budget. I mean, oh, sure. it's, absolutely. It's, absolutely. Yeah, and I think yeah. a lot of yeah. people don't realize that they, they think they think, oh, well, we want to produce a video, you know, like, you know, Four Seasons or a Rolls Royce or something like that. We're going to have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. And and the reality is that is what those companies do spend on that. But, right. you, you know, I, again, one thing I, I, I'm uh, uh, push for media stone is that we're a boutique agency. We are scrap. We're always a scrappy crew. I usually go in there with just a, a few people on set to get things done as efficiently as possible. And I think yeah. again, and applying that efficiency to doing it, taking the, you know, high end approach and making sure that you've got yeah. story and you've got some compelling visuals, but you, you can definitely do it on, on when the you relative see, cheap. Yeah. And, and so keeping that, that smaller medium sized business owner in mind, are, are there, common you know mistakes or things that maybe they are they miss when uh, that that you could offer up a, a, some advice on oh don't do this or if you do this you know make sure you include that if they're trying to get their story out there mm -hmm. yeah i mean one thing i will say is that, is that i think small business owners or really any business owners they they put way too much emphasis on, on like scripting something or having their message written out and they're either reading from a cue card or yeah. they have their PR, their branding or their communications person saying, Hey, say it like this. This is the brand we are. You have to say it this way. And I find that that comes across as so inorganic and, and viewers today see through that, like so we, be we, more authentic, be more maybe? authentic, be more organic. Yeah. And I, again, that's why I love the documentary format is because we, we get business owners and craftspeople just talking like, like we're yeah, having a conversation great. now you, and, and with my editorial and journalistic background, you ask them questions to, to get people going at what they're excited about. And if someone has made this product that they're proud of and happy about, if they're reading from a spec sheet or they're, you know, reading from talking yeah, points dry. from their branding person, it's dry and it's no, nobody is good at reading a script except trained actors. And even then it comes across as kind of phony. I think what readers yeah. are really responsive to when they, when they hear the passion in someone's voice and they, you know, they see what they're so excited about. That's something that people can really connect with. That's and what cool. I love doing is capturing that recording, getting someone kind of just going, going, going. It, it, so, so I'm, I'm sure, you know, a lot of small business owners could talk for, for hours and upon hours about their business, but then T taking that that broader conversation that they've had and finding the pertinent moments and then being able to cut and splice and dice that and weave that that's into, great so into getting that that yeah that authenticity and excitement and passion you know maybe more important than having something perfectly scripted and and laid out and you know so uh it sounds like yeah yeah, yeah i just i i just don't like that but yeah yeah, yeah the cool. scripted and, and we and we're working with some some high-end brands we did some videos where like some some executives would come in their their pr person would would be basically sitting there holding their hand being like, Oh, say it like this, hmm. say it like that. Or they'd have yeah. things memorized. And every time it was like, you know, can we put that paper away? You know, I'm going to have you sit in the other room. Actually, you and me, we're just going to talk. Well, that's, an, I that's mean, cool. that's, that's an good. old school 
way of doing things, right? The, the very control the message idea of, of letting PR sort of run that. And there's, I mean, it worked, but it comes across as inauthentic at times. So, yeah, I, right, I just think no. with social with with everyone, p- people see through that. I mean, they, they know they know what's people real, know, they know how to see real. through that now. Yeah, That's yeah. I mean, especially yeah. with all, all the content on your phones, like people people can tell when you're being organic or when you're being authentic or when you're totally. not. Yeah. How are totally. you gonna get them to stop stop scrolling? Um, yeah. So what, one of the th- the things I I liked when doing some research uh, on your business is this concept of revenue driven audience engagement because I always you know would. Even and I know now it's it easier to measure effectiveness and A B testing and mm. uh, all this kind of stuff. But uh, talk about how if you can how businesses can measure this the, the type of impact that this storytelling marketing has because it sounds great, but you've got to drive customers. It's got to drive revenue, right? Ultimately, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and that, that's what, kind of what you touch on is a big thing. I mean, I think in in the olden days when you ran a magazine ad or a billboard or or even something on TV, it was very limited metrics about you know that you, it was very difficult to tell how many direct sales you actually got out of that. The reality is now you can tell very directly if your advertising is working or not. When someone runs an ad on Instagram and says, shop here, someone clicks on that and buy something, that's a very, right. very easy to see the ROI on your business there. But, but I think more importantly than that is is looking at, at the long lead of this stuff. And it, it's never just, okay, we'll tell an organic story. We'll, we'll make a great video. We'll put it on Instagram. And boom, the money will start pouring in. You have to look at these things from a bit of a longer story arc and you got to try some things and throw some things at the wall and see what sticks. And so again, getting back to, that's why I like the approach of creating a bunch of different assets, not just having one video and there you go. Thank you, ma'am. We're done coming up with a bunch of different assets, coming at it from a few different angles. And then you can see what works, see what resonates. Look at the metrics for your post. Look at the metrics for a photo, um, a photo-based post or a video-based post. See how those perform, see who those resonate with. And then when you find something that does work, then you can start to replicate that and push more of your content in that direction. So I'm, yeah. I'm a very big fan of trying a bunch of different things, seeing what works. And then when you find what works, do more things like that. And and luckily- Yeah, put more know, revenue behind it yeah. you know, for well, your advertising it. dollar, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, because if, if if you're spending money and that you see so the audience isn't, it's not resonating with the audience, which you can tell directly from metrics, then you don't put your your revenue and uh, your um uh, you know your investment into that moving forward. And so, but you got to try a few different things. Well, see yeah, what does work when you find we're, what works. We're big, that's we're where big your fans. Investment goes. We're big fans of mistakes here, and, and sure. so much so that we we lean into them. It's like okay, yeah. well, let's go let's go make make a bunch of mistakes and figure out the one thing that we did that wasn't a mistake. And then go further on that and forget about the rest. But it's, you know, we call them mistakes our tuition here because that way we can justify the money we've spent on them. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but it works out like it's yeah. not so bad. No. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Does. I'm a big fan of trying things and, and getting them wrong. You got to get things wrong a bunch of times before you can get a yeah. right. bunch of times. It, yeah, yes, that's what I keep telling myself. That's how yeah. I sleep. At and, night. and we always talk about action on the show and things you have to take action. And it, it sounds like you're we, the answer you just gave me about this revenue driven engagement that that might be an action item you could recommend or would recommend to like our small business listeners of just getting out there and trying things in a small scale and finding what works and then putting some more more uh, muscle behind that. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I, I mean, action, action is my recommendation. Like just get out there and do it and try it and, yeah. and see what works and see what doesn't, you know, I, I have a, a, um, a kind of associate I've been working with up here and, and talking to them. He, he runs um, uh, the small business lending up here. And, you know, he's, he's a bit, not an older guy, but older than me of a generation previous to mine. And he found a good audience, just posting cell phone videos to LinkedIn. He would just go and talk to his clients and kind of had, he may have had a selfie stick or just been doing it with his hand. He'd go in and he'd walk through business factories or one was a brewery and he would just kind of talk to his audience and talk to, talk to people. And it was sort of scattered, but it was, it was personal and it was organic and it worked. And he gave, you know, his, his clients, the people he'd been helping get small business loans, tell their story and he could show potential clients of him, what, what clients of his, who he's lending money to what they're doing. And it, I, I, I came across it and I said, Hey man, these are actually pretty good. And he would get a lot of likes and a lot of shares. And it, you know, LinkedIn isn't 
always the first platform that comes to mind when you think of business content, uh, uh, yeah, um, great right. content, but you know, you just got to get out there and do it and try some stuff. And when you figure out what works, just doing something on a small scale on your own, then you can decide, Hey, we think this works. Let's, let's maybe talk to an agency like media stone or, or it. you know, yeah. find one in your yeah. area. And, 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 and then, you know, where to invest your dollars, but just get out there and do it and just start posting. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, and it's, uh, you, you know, I, I, one thing that I would recommend from people that I think a lot of people think that, Oh, I, I can do social media. I get it. It's not that hard. You just post, it may not be that hard, but it takes a lot of time. And I, and I think yeah. too many, too many brands don't realize they need a dedicated person on social media and social media is not just Instagram and Facebook. It's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok, engaging across all these platforms all the time. You can't just post to social media and then hope that people engage with it. All the algorithms, especially for Facebook and, and Instagram, they want you to be part of their communities. They want they really want you to engage. Yeah, they want to see the that more you go talk right? to people, yep. the more you talk, you like other yep. posts, you have conversations with people, the more that the algorithm is going to reckon you, recognize you, and then your content and, and your posts and your account will get exposed to more people. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love the, you know, my my two takeaway things here today are you know, planning for the suite of content that you can create from the beginning and then parse it up and and use it on different platforms. I think that's just tremendously great advice. And also just that action, just getting out there, starting with something, don't be paralyzed, worried about maybe how great something looks at the beginning, especially if it's authentic. Um, it's, it's really great advice. And I, I think uh, our listeners, you know, will definitely benefit from, benefit from that. So, um, I, I love having you on the show. Tell tell us the, the best way for our listeners that have more questions to connect with you and to learn more about Media Stone Creative. Oh, yeah. So website, mediastonecreative.com. We are on all the social channels. Um, but yeah, just send, send me an email through through the website. Um, you know, happy to get in touch with you. And and we're doing a lot more, you know, through COVID. As production is slowed, we're, we're starting to get back into it and get back out there in the field. But I'm doing I'm I'm doing a lot more consulting than we used to be. Just people calling up and and talking through some business strategies and some content that's strategies. Great. And so I think that's a really helpful thing to have someone who's just sort of a professional sounding board. So you're not just saying I'm, I'm thinking about doing this or thinking about doing that. I'm doing a lot more consulting these days, and, and I've been finding that the people are really responsive to that. So you know, send me a note. I'll always happy to talk with with um, potential clients and and make new contacts. That's cool. The time flew. I, I, I love talking about this stuff. And so good. Uh, we, we, yeah, it's fantastic. But thanks again for coming on the show, Bailey. And uh, we'll put the links in, into our show notes as well up at businessshow.co. And uh, keep in touch and let us know how things are going and, and uh, stop by from time to time. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. It's, it's been great talking to you. Really fun. Thank you. Man, I, I love a person who is excited about the business that they are in. Yeah. Very, very much so. He, he obviously, you know, being a storyteller and wanting to get out there and 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 be passionate about your own story and also how other people can succeed. That that's part of the secret sauce, I imagine. Right? It is. He said he said yeah. two things early on that that made me realize why this interview was going to be so valuable for all of you listening, and hopefully you're still listening. Uh, but those are. Well, three things, but he, he phrased the first one two different ways. One was sort of the pessimistic way and then the, then the optimistic way. He said, if you don't have a story, you don't have a business. Or yeah, that was really good. Right. Like that. That's an interesting thing, because if you think you have a business, hopefully you have a story because otherwise you don't have a business. But the way he reversed that was every business has a story, Correct. which is a nice way yeah. to say it. But it's not quite as motivating as if you don't have a story, you don't have a business. <laughs> well, and, and I've, I've had this problem in the past, too, where you get so focused on the day to day like yeah. revenue and numbers because you're, you know, you, your pressure, you got to pay the bills and everything that thinking this story thing, it's just, oh, it sounds so good and everything. But it's it's a longer term process. But one once you get this concept and also the the assets that if you develop those, I've used things for years and years that we recorded and uh, video we had done, yeah. graphics we had created that we can cut up. Like whenever I had someone create graphics, I'm like, hey, you, I don't want just the final product. I need the Photoshop files with all the yes. layers. Oh, I need yes. everything because then I can, you know, uh, adjust things over time. And it was, you know, so when he, it really hit me when he said that about, 
uh, creating this content that then you can use over and over, well, not that, just on different platforms, but throughout time is that's really right. important. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and like I said during the episode, that soup that resonated very much with me because like literally while we are recording this episode, I've got Sadie, who is the, the person yeah. that we hired doing exactly that for some content that we're going to push out on world backup day, but it's yep, like, yep. like creating the longer one for the YouTube or Facebook, the shorter one for Instagram. Like it's all coming from the same source and all sending the same message, but in a way that is native to the platforms that people are on when they see it. And that's the yeah, key. And, yeah. and that's another way of also kind of uh, justifying maybe a larger budget because you're going to be able to reuse these mm -hmm. assets over time. And if you, if you stage it right at the beginning with that mindset and say, look, okay, whatever we get, I want all the original assets as well, not just the finished product. Yeah. Then you or one of your employees may sit down a year later and say, oh, you know, we could take that clip or I could take that graphic and this uh, content that we created and, and mix it up and match it. So you, you invested a little bit more at the beginning, but you've got this really long runtime of how to use that data. It's really, Absolutely. It's really valuable. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, no, it's great. Awesome. It's great. Good stuff. Thank well, you. thanks so much for listening. Oh, I, <laughs> I did something that I never, ever want to do. So I am going to finish that thought. I said there were two things and I only talked about oh. one. The yep. second one was articulate what you're offering and why your audience needs it. Super important way to make sure you frame the story that you're telling. And I, I thought that was very valuable, so I wanted to share yeah. it. And I didn't want to leave you all hanging with number two. <laughs> I was hanging, totally. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. Came through. But yeah, uh, we'd love to hear from you what you thought of the episode. Uh, if there's any you know areas you would like us to find people to come on and talk, feedback at businessshow.co. Um, we've got some really interesting topics coming up, and uh, we always appreciate hearing from you. Uh, if you're so inclined, go up and leave us a review at businessshow.co slash reviews. It really helps us. And uh, while we're trying to help you out here, we appreciate it. Absolutely, folks. Thanks so much for listening. And, uh, and hey, keep living that charmed life, will you? <laughs>